you start back where you started before. You mean about the first technical alliance office? Yeah. And what's this book? Um, uh, what's the name of it? The, oh, it's called um, Veblen, Thorsten Veblen and His America. And it's the only biography that, that's been written about Veblen. What is the name of it? Thorsten Veblen and His America. Thorsten Veblen and His America. By whom? By Joseph Dorfman. Joseph Dorfman or mm. Dorfman? Dorfman. Dorfman. Yeah. No, I haven't read it. And what does he contend that that uh, Well, he just ha he just um, when he talked about Veblen's activities in the New School, he said that after Veblen wrote um, the articles that were later published as um, Engineers and the Price System, which was in 1919, I guess, that he wrote, he published those articles. He started a group at the new school with a few people sort of on the side. He was giving a course, I guess, or a couple of courses. And this group was supposed to discuss the problems that he had brought up in the engineers in the price system, the problem of plan control. And well, it's, uh, it's not correct in substance or in fact. Uh, the technical alliance was in existence before the new school. And before uh, I ever met Veblen, and the articles in the Dial yeah, that's right. magazine, and that was edited at the time by Helen Marat. It later became a poetry magazine. Mm -hmm. yeah, now right. the those articles were later published in book form as the Engineers in the Price System. But those articles were written in the uh, dial as a result of uh, dinner luncheon conferences with myself and several others. And uh, nothing to do with the new school whatsoever. And in fact, I met Veblen at the old faculty club, Columbia University. And uh, I was taken up there and introduced to Veblen, Marjuni, Cal, and a whole lot more uh, by Montgomery Schuyler and Merrill Rogers. Merrill Rogers at that time was a advertising manager of the New Republic and a husband of Joy Young, the suffragette. You might have to turn that up uh, just a point or so. A little. That's better? Yeah. yeah. And we were engaged in this before the new school existed, you see. Mm -hmm. um, what, what were you doing at that, and when you first started, what, what kind of projects were you doing? Oh, research, research on resources and areas mm -hmm. and so on. Was it an independent thing? You weren't... Um, Purely independent. Yeah. In other words, I bought the furniture and equipped two floors at 107 Waverly Place mm -hmm. with my own money and then the engineers and scientists and technologists that I had had associated with me in World War I, they went out of work, you see. Mm -hmm. And a whole lot of them bunked in there and worked a day or two and go look for work or write letters for the the rest of the time. And uh, um, what about the association with the IWW? Was that later? Oh, that was uh, that way was later as the Technical Alliance. Uh -huh. uh, our association was simply that we undertook to provide them information on uh, several industries, but mm -hmm. our bigger job was with the Railroad Brotherhood. They don't say anything about that. No, I haven't come across that at all. Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's typical of when they want to mess up something. No, I never was a member of the IWW. No, it, it just, um, I no. guess it was mentioned in newspaper articles that you, w that you did a research project for <coughs> the IWW. Well, we did for Jet Lout, the economist in Washington, D.C., the economist and the Railroad Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. mm. And 
Now, what we supplied was information on the structure of the meatpacking industry, the copper, and uh, the agricultural. See, what we pointed out to them that in the report is that they, they were attempting to organize the migratory worker. And that there were about 1,200 combines in Kansas at the time. And uh, we pointed out the migratory worker wouldn't exist in a few years uh, when you got 15,000 migratory workers, or uh, combines. Well, the combines went to about 27,000, and there were no migratory workers. Now, up until that meeting in the faculty club, now that's long before the new school. Was that in 1918 still? Uh, that's the winter of 1918, mm -hmm. fall of 1918. Well, I had never met Veblen, I never read him. Now, Veblen, His association with the new school was through the Mrs. Whitney put up the five thousand yeah. a year for simply to keep Veblen. Do you know what um, kind of what kind of course he was giving at that time? Oh, he was concern? Uh, somewhat similar to what I read in his books. Uh, what would you call it? What look out? goes over on tape. Yeah? What are you doing? More wine. Well, that would be a... Simply when I turn, see, when I turn away from the mic, you see, you got it up too high now. Huh? Just that when I turn away from the mic, it's, this is so sensitive. Pardon me, go ahead with that question. Like, Oh, um, what kind of course? I think Dorfman said that Veblen was, gave a course in which he treated the ideas that he used no. in those dial articles. Oh, no, not at all. He didn't. No. And then he wrote this cockeyed thing about the uh, Savietta technician, which we jumped him for. Yeah. He had no more idea than Veblen had of a technological structure than... Uh, Susie Q on Broadway. Did. Yeah. I mean, he, he had a uh, an inquiring mind, and he had a uh, interesting sense of humor. But he wasn't a tr he wasn't trained from the technical side. Hmm. I think I'm the only person that ever kept Bevelin up till after three o'clock in the morning. He stayed at my place, along with all the others, till after three in the morning. And did you, you discuss the? Did you discuss the idea of the? Um well, we had a series of, of dinners and luncheon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somewhere at the Columbia Club, that's the downtown, on Forty Third Street. And uh, oh, what was the name of Robinson? Uh, he came and sat in the corner. He was a professor, and he wrote the mind in the making from taking notes at the meeting. Oh, his name is Robinson? Huh? Robinson? Robinson, I can't think of his oh. first name. Hmm. The mind in the making is the name of the, the book. And um, did you, did you, Keep, was the Technical Alliance in existence all the way through the 20s? Pardon? Was okay. it, was I the can't hear you. Um, was the Technical Alliance in existence all through the 20s? Oh, yes. And it was doing active research yeah, all through the it, 20s? It went up and down in its activities, but nothing, nothing spectacular. And uh, how did you come to be associ associated with Columbia? University. We never were associated with Columbia. 
Well, um, what about the energy survey? I mean, you know, well, like yes, we we had other space besides Columbia University. We had uh, the big drafting room, the huge ones of Voorhees, Camille, and Walker at 101 Park Avenue. Well, then Dr. Reitenstahl, who was dean of industrial engineering, mm -hmm. they didn't have any students in that whole building. And uh, he said, uh, well, they're empty. We got drafting table. We got some calculating machines. And uh, I had all these engineers, you know, and draftsmen and so on that were on relief. And the engineering societies asked me, if, what could you do with them? You couldn't get them out to sell apples. And, and I said, well, we can give them a research job to do. And they said, you can? And I said, yes. And uh, we wound up, you know, uh, around 250 of them. Yeah. Now, Rautenstraud did it on his own. Oh, it was, it was independent of the university then? Well, I don't know how he did it. Uh -huh. He said, you can have the uh, floors here in the industrial engineering building. He had an office. Now, King Hubbard, Dr. King Hubbard, who was one of our men, he was uh, teaching geophysics at Columbia. Have you heard of him yes, at all? Yes, yes, I have. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, he had lunch with Rottenstrout, and Rottenstrout, he was telling Rottenstrout about the project, and uh, Rottenstrout suggested that I come up there and look the place over, and I could have the floor or two floors. And that's what started it. Mm -hmm. But we had other space beside Columbia. See? And Columbia University never had anything to do with either the uh, supplies or the direction of it. They were interested. Now, what, the, what have you found out of the reason at Columbia University? They claim they... Well, it's very, it's very confused. They, yeah. they claim that... Um, well, when the, when the big publicity first broke in August, I guess it was, in 1932, right? That's it. That, that. that was announced by Columbia, wasn't it? Well, that's, that's what I want to get, see what you've done in your research. Now, the <coughs> Nicholas Murray Butler's mm -hmm. political campaign manager and the head of the School of Journalism, or one of them, suddenly found out that Columbia had a big research project underway. That is, in Columbia University. Mm -hmm. So without consulting with us at all, they drew up a release to the press and sent it out apparently on Saturday for a release Monday. They knew how to do it, you see, because Monday's your bad day. If you can really hand the press anything, they'll give it front page. Well, we knew nothing about it. Until we <coughs> arrived up there at the engineering building and you had 40 reporters and sound trucks and movie tone sound news and all the rest. That's what started it. They didn't consult us at all. We didn't have any publicity staff or to handle it. Um, were, you, were you planning any specific publicity for, no. for any time in the future. No, we weren't interested in publicity. Yeah. We were interested in doing a job, which is an analysis of the energy determinants of the continent. Mm -hmm. Our approach was an entirely different one. Certainly it's radical and revolutionary. And then this, this just forced, this just forced, forced you to... Um, well, uh, it landed us in the midst of this yeah. publicity of which we didn't originate, and we couldn't, at the time, control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we called a body of thought, and this was way back in the technical alliance, we called a technocracy. Way back in 1919. What about Smith's um, contention that he invented the word technocracy? 
Technocracy has been invented by uh, at least seven or eight, oh. but never uh, in the sense that we use it. Mm -hmm. Now, he uh, also was in New York, and he used to come into a restaurant in Greenwich Village where he heard the discussions on it. And he wrote an article in an engineering magazine mm -hmm using the word technocracy as an efficiency system. Oh, he used it in a completely different sense then. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's been used way back by 1884 and 1889 and 1860 something. But never in the sense in which we used it. There was also a lot of discussion um, at the time in the 30s about the influence of Saudi's work. Had you read that before? Saudi had uh, anything to do with it. See, Saudi, of course, uh, gave a very nice newsreel interview, and he was glad that uh, um, they had hoped to bring out technocracy in, in England, Britain, yeah. the scientists. But he's glad that mm -hmm. it was done uh, in the United States. They had Fox Movie Town News. I'll give you a lead. You can look that up if you want to. I'm not sure they have <coughs> those in the libraries. I don't know where you'd get that. Do you? It might be in the, the Newsreel Library. They have them mm -hmm. way back. We did have a copy of it, but in moving out here, we don't know what happened to it. Um, did you have any further relations with um, with Veblen during the twenties, or was he just in those in those first discussions? No, in, in that period. In the early he, he personally became interested in what we we're doing. Yes, mm -hmm. but I'm just trying to clear up, clarify yeah. uh, the original situation. Yeah. That's and right. this uh, Montgomery Schuyler. See, he had been head of the testing laboratory in the city of St. Louis. Well, he later, uh, <coughs> oh, he did some work for several organizations in Encyclopedia Britannica. And then in 33, uh, the Roosevelt administration gathered up, you know, all the technocrats and ex-technocrats they could lay their hands on. You mean to work in the, in the government? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Leon Henderson was price administrator. Leland Olds was federal power administrator. Uh, have you ever seen the Technical Alliance Bulletin? No, I couldn't get a hold of anything before. Our sections across the country have one in every section. I haven't been able to find any, any of them before 1935 or something like that. Find out from you um, if there's a section in Boston or around Boston that no, I can. Uh, there isn't. We there have isn't. some members in uh, Rhode Island and uh, New Hampshire. We have a unit in St. John's, New Brunswick. We have members in Newfoundland. Uh, I can take you over in the house later and show you. We got some photographs of sections all up on the wall, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, we're strongest, you see, in the central manufacturing area of the United States, and uh, out on the 
Pacific Coast and in Western Canada. I spoke in Boston several times. Now this is kind of getting yellow around the Look at those names. That was the original committee of the TA. Nineteen nineteen. Mm -hmm. I just lay this down so I can see it. Ackerman was the architect. Cornell University and other big buildings. Car Dr. Allensburg was chief chemist of the Bureau of Agriculture. Alan Carpenter was doctor and surgeon in New York. Comstock was head of the Comstock engineering firm. It's still the biggest electrical contractors in New York. They did all the uh, electrical work at the World's Fair. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Stuart Chase, you know. Yeah. Well, Stuart Chase, when I met him first, was an accountant in the Federal Trade Commission in Washington. I pulled him out of that and he wrote this uh, first article in the office of the Technical Land. Oh, really? Yes. And uh, he worked on the uh, Railroad Brotherhood Report. Yeah. Alice Bowers Fernandes, Dr. Bowers was a Deputy uh, Commissioner of Education in the United States. Department of Education in Washington. Bassett Jones, uh, electrical engineer, was a member of the firm of Meyer, Strong and Jones, consulting to General Electric, uh, Otis Elevator, and co-inventor and developer with Clarence Birdseye of Frosted Foods. Really? <laughs> yeah. Does that, my voice come over all right on? Good. Uh, Robert H. Cohn was a, what was the official name, was it the American Institute of Architects? Anyway, he was president of the Institute of Architects. Benton Mackay, when I first met him, was in the Department of Forestry. I pulled him out of that. His brother was uh, Percy Mackay, the dramatist and the poet. I don't think I've heard of him. Oh yeah, he's on Broadway. Benton Mackay later went on uh, to uh, lay out and publicize. He's the creator of the Appalachian Trail. Hmm. Leland Old, uh, statistician, and he became secretary of the New York State Power Authority. And Roosevelt made him federal power administrator. Charles P. Steinmetz, of course, was General Electric. Tolman, Dr. Tolman, was uh, at this time, was head of the Fixed Nitrogen Research Laboratories in Washington, D.C. He became Dean of Physics of Caltech. He's the one that taught Oppenheimer and all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And in the war, he was atomic representative of the Combined Chiefs of Staff of the United States and Great Britain and co-administrator with uh, Vandenberg Bush of All Your Science. John Carroll Vaughan was a great surgeon, head of the Mandible Clinic. Thorsten Veblen, you know, Whitaker was editor of the Architects Institute Journal. So you have quite a collection of stuff. Roosevelt did was uh, he grabbed off everybody that had any association with technocracy, either in some way or other. Uh, Leon Henderson was made price administrator. Leon Olds was made 
uh, power administrator. Now, uh, now, what's his name? He and Stuart Chase did most of the work of our report to the Railroad Brotherhood. Uh, can't get his name now, and I want to. He became deputy chief of ODT, Office of Defense Transportation, during the war. Who was the um, person who took the name of Frank Arkwright to write the book? Well, that's a... Uh, I can't think of the name. He was in the uh, Harper and Company. Because it, I read somewhere that he was a well-known journalist, but no one ever said who he was. Oh, he's, uh, he was one of the top men in Harper and Company publishers. See? We lent him books and we spent ninety-some dollars, ninety-two dollars additional, to buy him additional books to read up on it. And I didn't have time to write. Now, what happened um, in 1933 when you left Columbia and went, I guess you went back to the offices or just <coughs> used the offices on Park Avenue then? Yeah, we were using that. Then we uh, had an office on Madison Avenue and then we had an office on 3rd Avenue and then we moved into the Commerce Building where we stayed, uh, let's see, from 37 to 1950. How many years is that? 13? Yeah, 13, 14 years. Mm -hmm. And we left the Commerce Building and came out here and bought this farm. Yeah. Well, was there, was there a, um, as the newspapers played it up, there was a big, a big feud or a big split between you and the people at Columbia? No, no. What happened was that the <coughs> National Arts Society of Arts and Science gave this annual dinner, which they usually give. And the dinner was held at the Hotel Pierre mm -hmm. with a radio hookup uh, clean across Canada and the United States in short wave to the world. Well, the pressure was on, and Rottenstaud had agreed to introduce me with five minutes uh, of introduction. And then he wanted, uh, that is, they arranged that two months or something before. And then he comes through and wants 20 minutes to explain what his position is. See. Leon, you'll find it in the Herald Tribune where Leon Henderson and a couple more, we asked them to resign, and they resigned. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and of course they thought they were going to take the research uh, away from technocracy. Well, they didn't do any such thing. And one group offered Rottenstroud a quarter of a million dollars endowment to continue the research, and they also offered him uh, the position of being head of the Industrial Conference Board. But then he declined that when he found out that uh, uh, he would sacrifice his university pension if he took it. Besides, he, as Dean of uh, Industrial Engineering at Columbia, he had three or four very nice industrial consulting accounts, which as a university professor he could hold. But as head of the Industrial Conference Board, he couldn't, uh, he'd have to res relinquish those. And his income from the consulting accounts were higher than that of his salary at Columbia University. It's all very complicated, see? So he stayed at Columbia then? Pardon? He stayed at Columbia. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. see? So he resigned, 
The only one that was at Columbia that still remained with us was King Hubbard and one or two lesser individuals. Um, what did what did you think of the reactions of the bankers and the people who became ver very interested in the well that, that was typical you see they didn't know what it was and the press broke it yeah. well then they went for it well then when they discovered that it was really uh, radical and revolutionary in other words we consider communism so far to the right that it's bourgeois yeah. Well, they, uh, instinctively, they were correct. Their instincts were. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what it was. But when it dawned on them, uh, what we were designing was something far more revolutionary than socialism or communism or fascism. Yeah. Then they flipped right over. See, they proposed to us that they set up a committee of 100 and would uh, endow us with plenty of money if they could edit anything we turned out. We declined the platinum handcuffs. <laughs> Maybe we should have taken the money. Yeah. I wouldn't say that we were necessarily correct in, in one sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, there was there were, was mention of in some of the articles I read of of a specific sort of propaganda campaign after after the publicity broke around in January. Who, whose campaign? Well, by they, whom? By by the by Technocracy Incorporated. No, we was went it? on a speaking tour across the country and we organized section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was thirty four. That was much later then. Yeah. 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 But you see, you have to get the picture straight. The Roosevelt administration sent a, set up this National Potential Product Capacity Survey. And they grabbed off uh, Montgomery Schuyler and Felix Fraser and some more. And uh, they started a right deviation known as the Continental Committee on Technocracy. Oh, that was, se that was a separate organization? Yes, now we had a Continental Committee, but they grabbed the name. Now we applied for incorporation in 1932, but the political interference delayed the uh, issuing of the charter until 1933. And that was only done because uh, the firm of attorneys threatened to uh, issue a writ of mandamus on the Secretary of State in Albany, New York to show just cause as to why it shouldn't be. And it came forth with in a hurry. And our attorneys were Cadwallader, Wickersham, and Taft. <laughs> Strange bedfellows. <laughs> it really is. There's a lot of interesting stuff in all, involved in all this. What was the name of that, the Roosevelt administration thing that you just mentioned? The National Potential Product Capacity Survey. Now, they were put on the federal payroll to make this survey. And they went out across the country speaking on the uh, Continental Committee of Technocracy. And they had some financial backing beside the federal government. Now, we stopped it because Harold Rowe was also on this national potential project. He never was a member of technocracy. Mm -hmm. He wrote Life Under Technocracy, and we refused to approve it, and three or four big publishers turned it down because we... But he was employed on the federal payroll. Well, he and Felix Fraser went out speaking across the country, and they got a professor at Marquette University, uh, 
and somebody out in Denver, and then a woman up in Seattle, a woman lawyer. When he got to Canada, <coughs> we found out what their federal payroll numbers were and sent their federal payroll numbers to Canada. They had crossed the boundary line. You can't cross the boundary line as a government employee of either Canada or the United States, vice versa, and speak on another subject. Mm -mm. That's contrary to the law. So they were stopped. And the Continental Committee was closed up by the Postal Department, Post Office, United States Post Office later. Now that was in 33 that they did this, right after Roosevelt took office, you see. <laughs> And that uh, National Potential Product Capacity Survey was under the chairmanship of Langdon Post. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Langdon Post married, married uh, what was the millionaire cartoonist? He only had one child, a daughter. He m and Langdon Post married the daughter. Uh, Hirschfeld? Hmm? Hirschfeld? Pardon? Hirschfeld? I can't you hear know? you, my dear. Hirschfeld. The one who does the the no, New York Times cartoons. No. Oh, he he was one of the first cartoonists in strip uh, comic thing. Hmm. When he made a million or so out of a couple of million. Uh, who did? Uh, I can't think of it right now. Langdon Post married his daughter. And Langdon Post gave me a dinner at this apartment on Park Avenue, which was attended by Walter Lippmann, uh, Roy Howard, Ken Cooper of the Associated Press, and all the whole slew more. Yeah. See, we were naive. We didn't know who the political hucksters were, you know. Very interesting, because we had to get educated too, but not the, not in what we were doing, but in what we had to battle. We could design any kind of scientific or technical engineering apparatus, but uh, our contact were not with the political financial. Did you have any trouble with the socialist and communist organizations at that time? Very, very little. Uh, oh, they later attacked us. Uh, the two chief um, attacks were the Communist Party, some socialists, and the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church lifted. There was a, a series in the Daily work, uh, the um, mass, what was it? What was the communist paper the, in New York? It's the worker now. The wor worker, it was, it was a worker, in which they had photographs and they attacked us trying to make out we were fascists, you see. Well, the Catholic press reprinted that thing, comma for comma, never once admitting that they took it from the uh, communist press and published it simultaneously in 47 diocesan papers. Hmm? And yet a year before, the Jesuit Catholic America had advised every Catholic engineer to join technocracy. That's before the flip over. Hmm? <laughs> but there aren't any many Catholic engineers, you know, or scientists. Uh, relatively few. In fact, the smallest percentage, Jewish have quite a high percentage of mathematicians and mm -hmm. so on, but 
your Catholic out. They go in for law and. Do you think that's because a lot of them go to go to Pardon? Catholic universities? Pardon? Do you think that's because a lot of them go to Catholic universities? I, I can't hear you, my dear. Do you think the reason for that is that a lot of Catholics go through Catholic universities and they yes. probably don't? Well, you're a, you're old university in Europe. Yeah. Uh, you see what they went in for the arts, for history, mm -hmm. for law and logic, but not science. Mm -hmm. I knew the same way here. Well, they, they try to pick it up and modernize it here, but uh, it isn't comparable to a modern engineering college. What, what do you think um, was the total effect of all the publicity in 1932 and 33? Do you think it was bad for your organization or? Mm, bad and good, depending on how you view it. If we had had a big office staff on the publicity. We could have handled the darn, but we had no, we only had one typewriter. <laughs> and when mail poured in the thousands and telegrams by the thousand, uh, you simply didn't have the facilities to handle uh, such a mass impact. And they were the the press was running wild. So was every writer and everything else. Mm -hmm. See, Stuart Chase wrote a book right at that time. Well, he, he didn't come to us, but he had three chapters or more on technocracy. When the, publishers call, the publishing company called us up, and he had to take the three chapters out. Yeah. He did write a, a short pamphlet on it. Oh, yes. And he, went on a, and he went on a speaking tour mm -hmm. across the country. Uh, and the big t speaking tour agency uh, uh, publicized it, two dollars and a half. Uh, but th that activity was approved by, no, no. by you? Oh, what? No, no. Oh, no. These people, everybody stepped into the act, you see, to get aboard the, the gravy train. <laughs> And we had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Well, they had a wonderful time for about a couple of years. See, when they flipped over to the attack side, then they tried to bury it. See, the technocracy's really been dead, you know, we're zombies. <laughs> yeah. I know, um, I remember reading in some, I think it was a book by a couple of communists who claimed that the communist press was what what stamped it out. They claimed that the communist press. Oh, well, they all they all said, claimed that. Oh, yeah. They never stamped it out. Yeah. In other words, we didn't have any endowments or rich angels. We didn't have a subsidies from foreign governments like the Communist Party. Yeah. So we've existed on our own. Membership dues, our literature. And uh, at the time of the publicity, we were only a, a relatively small group. Mm -hmm. Well, today we're spread out across the continent. How many members do you have now? Well, you never make any statement on membership. Mm -hmm. Never have, never will. And not mm -hmm. just the same as when we introduce anybody on the platform. We do not engage in eulogy of who he or she is. Just that they're an officer or director or so on of technocracy. Mm -hmm. But we have our own printing plant. We own some nice section buildings. We have some little section headquarters. We have some that are as large as a, a supermarket, all depending on where it is. And you have to have 50 members to be chartered as a section with 11 board of governors, and they're elected every year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Continental Board of Governors are 12. And uh, 
three are elected every so there's a four-year term Um, are you still engaged in the in the same survey? You're not still engaged in the same survey that you were engaged in um, in the energy survey. Is well, it's all still uh, it's all energy determinants. Mm -hmm. see. In other words, what what was the picture? Not a financial picture, but the physical picture. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been proven correct. We came out uh, 40 years ago. And we stated that the farms of the United States would decline in numbers yeah, and increase in size. Mm -hmm. We also wrote a report on the iron ore, hematite ore, and the masaba that the viable economic feasible ore of the masaba uh, that the FE content would decline as a function of depth, I'm quoting now, and that the SI, silicon, would increase as a function of depth, and that the economic feasible ore would be exhausted by 1950 if there was the same continuous growth of uh, consumption in the steel industry of the United States. Well, of course, the Depression held it down, and she didn't kick off till World War II again, you see. But Masaba is gone right now. And copper, we're in a sad way because practically all the copper mined in the United States is eight-tenths of one percent or less. Our lead and zinc, our petroleum, we're only doing 11 barrels per well per day. And we've been kidding ourselves that we find new reserves. But uh, Iran, for instance, their barrels are 10,000 barrels per well per day, not 11. Hmm? See, what we contended then was that machines made jobs for machines, and only machines could produce machines. And if you kept on installing energy-consuming devices, you would finally arrive at the point where you would not require the services of the majority of the able-bodied adults in the United States to produce and distribute the physical wealth. It would be done by a minority. Now, that statement is decades old. See? Now, this is fundamental stuff, which they don't want to deal with in the propaganda mm -hmm. against us. <coughs> Now, of course, they're announcing from Moscow that the new uh, administration in Moscow are technocrats. <laughs> yeah, Marvin Kalb on CBS yeah. from Moscow. Huh. The technocrats have taken over in Moscow. Well, that's, that's nonsense. The idea did go abroad in the 30s. And you had with no uh, help from us and no affiliation. You had the Deutsche Technokratische Gesellschaft formed in Germany, and they've, a number of prominent German scientists and engineers, and they published the uh, Technokrati magazine. Good paper, good photographs. You had the Czechoslovakische Technokrati, a Spolint published in the Engineering Institute in Prague, and the Niederlandische Technikat, the Verban, and the Hague in Holland, and uh, the Norske something or other in Norway, and in Sweden, and, um, wait a minute, um, in Belgium, you had this that <laughs> chap ran as a technocrat. And he scored more votes than the fascist Ruxus de Grau. Hmm? Now in Italy, Mussolini started it off first. Uh, he arrested 27 uh, engineers.
engineers behind us. And threw them into imprisonment in Lapari. That's a prison now. One of them was the son of the Consul General, of, Italian Consul General of Switzerland. I'll give you an idea. Well, when the Allies liberated La Pari, they took them over to uh, North Africa. And lo and behold, they weren't soldiers. So they didn't receive the status of military prisoners. And there they were down near starving to death in North Africa in Allied hands. They weren't soldiers, they were political prisoners. Well, when Hitler came into power, he promptly squashed the Deutsche Technokratische Gesellschaft. And when he took over Czechoslovakia, the Technokratie Spolensk, um, Czechoslovakia was, yeah. some of them escaped, some of them died. And uh, right now in France you have the, uh, you know, just trying to think of his name, you have this organization that uh, even carries our literature on their list in France, and they broadcast every once in a while, and they publish it. There are two organizations. One is political, and the other isn't. Uh, La Bonne Dance. The movement for, for the abundance. Uh, movement for abundance. And um, Dubois, is it? I think so. Jacques. Yeah, Jacques Dubois is the head of it. So uh, it survived even the war. And the but please understand that we had no, no part in the setting up of any of that. Just mm -hmm. mushroom was part of it. We've never had any contact with the Russians, and so we don't know anything about that. But to say that there are technocrats in Russia or in France under de Gaulle is nonsense. Well, do they mean it specifically um, in reference to this movement, or just using Well, they're the using the term, you see, yeah. but they're planning and design. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're anything that's of national design now is synonymous with uh, mm -hmm. technocrats and technocracy, you see. Of course, it's incorrect to use it that way, but that's uh, partly done to confuse it, especially when they're French Catholic writers. Well, you ask me some more questions. Uh, um, well, uh, do you have any ideas on how, s on how soon the the technological unemployment will really reach? Well, it doesn't only unemployment, you see. Or just... Let me see if I can give you a picture. In 1920, John L. Lewis had 780,000 coal, bituminous coal miners. Today, he only has 235,000. Now, true, the John L. Lewis and the coal operators have raised the coal mining per man to the highest in the world, 8 to 14 tons per man. But the new machines coming in do 8 tons a minute. In other words, John L. Lewis isn't going to have 235,000 very much longer. Your American railroads had 2,140,000 in 1920. It's now down to uh, less than 800,000, including station employees. What about the, the federal program to retrain people who are, like in the coal mining districts in Virginia and whatnot, they're retraining them? Look, my dear, the trouble with all of this is that any philosophic approach, any moral approach, any humanitarian approach is invalidated utterly and completely by the technological progression of the next 30 minutes. That is what they cannot see. They're thinking in terms of, 
um, dollars and economics and balance sheets when it's a physical problem. Now the consolidations of railroads that are coming up will trim another 200,000 employees out. Well, there'll be no future for the youth of America in railroading, coal mining, chemical, cement. You can go on down the line. Your ideal cement company today has beautiful new plants in which are operated by tape, and there's only one man per shift required to operate a giant cement plant. Now, the same thing is hitting your white-collar workers now. The steel workers have lost 200,000 employees in the last 10 years. And they're now firing uh, five to 8,000 white collar, no longer required. Uh, this is the kind of material you're looking for, is it? Well, um, <clears throat> what See, we brought this out years ago. Yeah. Uh, what about and uh, we were considered a little crazy. You see, oh, it will never happen in our time. Maybe sometime, but not in our time. Well, it's happening. Yeah. Uh, what about the idea that um, people who were put out of work completely by, by technological improvements would be absorbed in new industries which are just developing? No, you did it temporarily in the services the last 15 years. Commission selling, advertising, publicity, uh, welfare, uh, all the services mm -hmm. did increase several times, you see. And that lost the real situation over because it appeared to uh, get, be a factor of stabilization by absorbing, but uh, that has stopped. And your new industry today has technological equipment never dreamed of 20 years ago. The Russians are running into the same thing. You're running into it in Britain. British unemployment is rising. It'll be th three quarters of a million to a million by June. But has the unemployment rate really risen <coughs> substantially in this country? It's risen, it but then our unemployment figures, matter. See? Only those are registered as unemployed who are drawing unemployment compensation. All those who came out of school and never had a job are not registered. And those who have run out of their compensation. Now, we have several million people holding two and three jobs. And that's recorded as each job is required. Well, but it's, you've got two and a half million people. Now, that's a misnomer. It gives a fictitious uh, total. And the Canadian or British uh, statistics are much more reliable than those of the United States. Do you have, do you have information on, on the difference between the, 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 re the figure that's on the the figure that's drawn up from the unemployment um, compensation rolls and the real figure of unemployment. Do you know well, what? Well, the, the real figure would run near eight percent in the United States. If you're including those who are washed out, and those that are work looking for work but have never had a job. Don't they, can't they account for them by, peop by people who are on relief and whatnot? Wouldn't they be counted that way? Well, that, uh, that cushions the effect. But then they're not getting sufficient money to purchase the uh, increasing production. You see, your, your physical output is rising with less and less man hours all the time and less and less employment. Take this last year, 62. Well, what happened? The production went up, but your f manufacturing employment in the United States did not increase. Steel production for 1962 is barely 400,000 tons more than 1961. 
in spite of all the money pumped into the economy. Uh, we didn't make these figures. Now, do you have any specific ideas on, on um, what will happen, say, in the next 10 years? Oh, yeah. Based on your... See, the, the moment that your energy consumed per capita rises to a certain figure, then uh, you no longer can employ the majority of a uh, working adult. In other words, you can produce abundance and distribute it with a minority of your working population. Well, then you'll have to pay uh, everybody, whether they work or not, the same amount. It's going to be rather complicated under the social system, isn't it? <laughs> <coughs> did, did you foresee the crash in 1929? Oh, yeah. You think, do you think there'll be another Not of the same thing? kind. No, in July 1932, I predicted that the banks of the United States would close on or before April 1933. And the Attorney General of the United States under Hoover wanted to uh, move for my indictment on the basis that I was making statements inimical to the safety of public institutions. And on the last of, uh, what is it, February? All right. Uh, 1933, I was speaking, I was the first speaker on the platform of the National Education Convention in the big auditorium in, in Minneapolis. And Dr. Glenn Frank, who was then president of the University of Wisconsin, was to follow me on the platform. Well, I made the same statement. And uh, when I got back to the Curtis Hotel, the uh, mayor of Minneapolis and the uh, district attorney and attorney general were all there. Uh, here I had made statements because people started going out of that auditorium like this. I asked them if they had a return ticket and if they had uh, any money in the bank to wire home to withdraw the money. And. Uh, they really came up with intentions of arresting me. The only thing that stopped it was the manager of the hotel called up the suite and says, Mr. Scott, the extras have just hit the street. The governor of Ohio has closed all the banks in Ohio. The difference in time between Columbus, Ohio and Minneapolis. Uh, that did it. I said, send up a hundred copies. <laughs> You get the picture of the Roosevelt administration with all these people in it. Uh, I'm still trying to think of, what's his name then? ODT. Uh, he was engineer for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad when we drive.